Uh, I'm Len Jessup. Yeah, there we go. We're recording. Let's go. Uh, I'm Len Jessup, president at Claremont Graduate University. Welcome to the latest installment of CGU in Conversation. We're very excited about this one today with Rick West. Um, I have a co-conspirator today who you can see there, Josh Good, and Josh will be helping me out. Josh is an associate professor of cultural studies and history and chair of our history department here. And he teaches a number of courses for us. I think Josh, the most interesting of which is the interdisciplinary course you do with the team over at Bath Spa University, where you've got students from there and students from here. They work together, uh, you know, learning about the history of Southern California and Los Angeles in particular for like a week. And then, and then everybody goes over to England uh, near Bath Spa University and, and learns together studying history there as well. Uh, we hear from the students that that's an incredible experience. So thanks for joining us, Josh. Maybe we'll hear more about that. But Josh is here with us because he is our connection to our, our guest, uh, Rick West. So <clears throat> Josh, if you wouldn't mind saying a few words to set us up and introducing Rick, that would be great. Great, sure thing. Thanks, Len. And um, uh, thanks to all of you for coming to this uh, conversation. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. I have to say it's a, it's a sincere pleasure to welcome Rick West uh, to CGU to engage uh, with President Jessup in this conversation series that he's done with leaders uh, from around the world and advocates uh, from around the world. I can say Rick's 50 year career is a study in leadership and advocacy, but it's also a career particularly marked by its geographic reach and impact. And let me show you, let me show you how. Many of you know Rick as the president and CEO of the Autry Museum of the American West, which he has led since 2013, and a position from which he will retire in June of 2021. I'm particularly grateful to Rick for helping forge some of the curricular and programmatic partnerships that we've enjoyed with the Autry during his time there. But if most of you know Rick as the leader of the Autry, you will also probably know that he arrived at the Autry after serving for nearly two decades as the founding director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, DC, a position he held from 1990 through 2007. His leadership in both institutions has been transformational, marked by large increases in annual attendance, collections development, fundraising, along with a host of programmatic and curatorial innovations. But all of this and all of this, transform, uh, this transformation has been most underscored by an intellectual disposition, a distinct desire, not just to undo the traditional moments of, modes of representing Native American peoples in the display and narrative of museums, but also in the very way the historical narratives of the United States and indeed the Western hemisphere have been presented and understood. Prior to his work in museums, Rick was an attorney in uh, two different law firms, first in Washington, DC, and then in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where his advocacy work, especially on behalf of Native Americans, flourished, serving as counsel to num numerous American Indian tribes, communities, and organizations. He represented clients before federal, uh, state, and tribal courts, various executive departments of the federal government, and Congress. He has also served on far more boards than I can list right now, but I will note the leadership roles that Rick invariably came to inhabit on those boards. He has served as the chair of the board of the American Alliance of Museums, and more recently as the vice president of the International Council of Museums. And again, that's just to name a few. But let me now begin at, or end at the beginning, uh, both completing or starting Rick's peregrinations around, uh, around the United States. A citizen of the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes, Rick was born close by in San Bernardino, California, the son of the artist Walter Richard West Sr. and Mary Bell McRae West. He then moved early in his life to Muskogee, Oklahoma, where he grew up. He returned to Southern California to attend the University of Redlands, where he graduated magna cum laude, and then off to Harvard, where he received a master's degree in American history. Then back to California to attend law school at Stanford, from which he received his degree in 1971, after, not surprisingly, serving as an editor of the Stanford Law Review. 
So leadership, advocacy, movement from beginning to end. Rick, we've got you stationary now for a few minutes to have this conversation. <laughs> Thank you for coming here and we're honored to have you. Not at all. I'm glad to sit still for just a little bit anyway and <laughs> talk with all of you. Rick, thank you for being here. Josh, thanks for that uh, great introduction. So Rick, I'm sitting here, actually I've got the, you know, this false background of campus, but I'm about a block off campus here in Claremont. So where do we find you today? Where are you sitting and what, what have you got behind you there? That's a beautiful- Well, I'm, I'm sitting in our living room because we've been working at home for uh, the last year, as you may know. Yeah. And behind me actually is one of my favorite paintings by a very distinguished contemporary native artist. Um, and uh, I'm kind of surrounded by that art here in the living room, including some of my dad's work too. So I'm at home, I'm at home talking. With you. And Josh, it looks like you're at home as well out on the west side. I am at home in Los Angeles. Excellent. In the back house. Well, <laughs> maybe to piggyback off of the end of your the introduction, Josh, Let's, Rick, just start there, you know, born in San Bernardino, uh, and then I went off to Oklahoma, but then back to uh, have a very successful undergraduate career at University of Redlands. So as you think back to that, those beginnings, what were the motivating forces or who were the motivating forces? If you think about your parents and perhaps teachers or coaches mm -hmm. or whoever it might have been that set you on this path uh, that's quite illustrious, how, how did you get your start? Well, I, I, what I would say is that my start is illustrative of the rest of the story, uh, if you will, in some respects. We were out here uh, during World War II because my dad was stationed in the Navy in both San Francisco and San Diego and then at sea. And uh, my mother's folks lived in, uh, lived in Redlands, actually. And that, that's why, how I came to be born in St. Bernardine's in San Bernardino. But my dad really wanted the family to go back to Oklahoma if you will, and my mother was quite agreeable to that. My dad is native, my mother was not. And, and so we moved uh, back to Oklahoma just shortly after World War II. And uh, I grew up there. I'm quite literally an Okie from Muskogee. Um, and uh, that's where I had my beginnings. And, and it, was, it was emblematic of things to follow. You know, I'm, I am uh, white on one side of my family, native on the other, raised culturally from a cultural standpoint, really within the Cheyenne community, uh, which I've remained close to uh, through my own history. And I go back to Oklahoma routinely uh, at the present time. And I've always been a, a, a bit of a border walker, if you will. In other words, I've been in positions which are actually mediating or engaged positions between the tribal community on the one hand and non-native communities on the other. And uh, we'll talk more about that as we go along. But those were signaled, actually, in my beginning years growing up in Oklahoma. Excellent. I'll turn it over to Josh and, and have him go next. Josh? Thanks. Well, so uh, I have a long opening question, but it's partially long because, and hopefully we can break it down, but it's partially long because you know, we asked uh, the uh, people who are interested in attending uh, this conversation or viewing the conversation to pre-submit questions. And I think those questions kind of neatly divided between asking you uh, about sort of your opinion about the contemporary conditions of uh, Native American life today uh, and your sense of the future, but also, you know, a variety of questions about your, your leadership at the Autry, your mission and museum life. And so the first question I think is, you know, as I look at it, is kind of overly long, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, when you left the National Museum of the American Indian, uh, you gave a talk. And in that talk, you said your mission there was to tell the audience to present, to present sort of a new and different uh, image of the Native American in the museum. And you said then your mission was to say, we are not dead. We are still here and not always in the image or form that they think they know us or that the audience thinks that they know us. So now, a few years after that, you transition away from the Autry. What would you say were the challenges you faced coming out of the NMAI heading into the Autry? Uh, what drew you to the Autry? And what are you proudest of as you exit? So I, I told you it's a long question. So break it up, <laughs> break it up how you want. 
Well, I will not burden you with a lawyer's long answer. I'll try to be as much to the point as I can be. Uh, th there's a relationship. There are distinctions between the two institutions and the two parts of my museum career, uh, which was, of course, preceded by my career as a native rights lawyer. Um, but there's a linkage. There's a linkage that's very important for me. The National Museum of the American Indian grew out of, if you will, the multiculturalism movement in American history and culture and narrative uh, that grew up in the late 1980s and early 1990s. And the form that that, that that conversation took where there was focus on cultural communities that had been kind of set apart from the rest of American society or, or not as fully represented as they actually are in their existence in American society. And the form that that took in museums was the ethnic specific museum, which in its origins, the National Museum of the American Indian definitely is. Now, as you point out, uh, there are several things going on when you're talking about an institution like that, a multicultural institution. Normally, it speaks in museum terms to communities which have not been at the table of conversation previously and brings them to that table in a museum setting. And that's what happened at the NMAI. And it's three very distinct uh, three-part component of, of the mission of the institution were initially to make sure that people understood that native peoples themselves knew a great deal about their own cultures and that they had authenticity and authority to talk about them. And second, what you adverted to earlier, namely that we are still here. We have deep history, but we have contemporary life. There are probably 30 to 40 million people in the Americas that are definably from a cultural standpoint, native and indigenous right now about three to four million of them here in the United States now. And then finally, the third component of the, of the goals and, and aspirations of the National Museum of the American Indian were to make sure that that institution through its collections, its human expertise, struck relationships with native communities that museums never had before. So that was the quantum or the various quantums, if you will, of a multicultural institution. It was to give voice from an internal standpoint and an affirmation of native culture. Now, the Autry and what intrigued me about it, and I did indeed come out of retirement to go to the Autry. I had been happily retired for about a half decade uh, when I was approached uh, by the uh, late chairman emeritus of uh, the Autry, uh, Marshall McKay, uh, to come to the Autry. What intrigued me about the Autry is that from, from an ethnic specific museum standpoint, it was the creation of a number of verticals, uh, people in communities who were trying to gain representation of whom Native Americans were one, but it could speak to other communities, the African American community, the Japanese American community, et cetera. But the Autry, the Autry was constructed along much more horizontal lines, if you will. There was integration there was interconnection. It was an intercultural institution rather than a multicultural institution. And that's what intrigued me because I thought that was a far more in the end uh, appropriate way and a full, more fulsome way to describe American history and American experience rather than having a set of often segmented um, cultural ethnicities that were set up vertically. That's what I liked about the Autry. A follow-up question, Rick, if you don't mind. You've been an attorney and a museum director and throughout all of that, an advocate for much of your life around a more complex view of the U.S. and the Native American past within it, uh, both past and present. So the question is more around the museums as medium. Why museums for that work? And why? how, how did that come to be the medium that you've chosen? And maybe what have you allowed you to do versus uh, advocating in, in other ways, in other media? media. Well, that, that's an interesting question. What I would say is that um, I see the first part of my career and the second part of my career, one being as a practicing lawyer addressing Native rights for the most part, and the second part of it being uh, a museum director, first at NMAI and now at the Autry, as being an integration. And let me describe that integration just briefly, because that has a lot to do with why I went from where I was to where I am and why I'm in museums now. Um, the uh, 
first career as a lawyer and basically as a native rights lawyer, even though it was in a firm that was the Washington office of a large Wall Street law firm on, uh, in, in New York City. And that's a whole other story. And we don't need to go there. But that's how I ended up at this particular law firm uh, representing tribal clients from throughout North America, quite frankly. And um, that was really addressing the legal and constitutional rights and prerogatives of native communities. I think most lawyers even don't understand that the area of American Indian law is, is an entity unto itself in the practice of law in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, there are different rules that apply there, different precedents that apply there, different constitutional provisions that apply there, but it spoke to the self-governance, if you will, as, as polities and as a political matter of native communities. And, and so that was my first objective, but I hadn't been doing that too long before it came to me, and this was partly in having an artist father uh, on my native side, that I saw the cultural dimension of that. And the cultural dimension of it was that along with these affirmations of constitutional and legal rights, we needed to figure out a way that there could be self-representation and, and, and continuation into the future of the cultural aspect of being native uh, in, in this hemisphere. And so there, there, was a, there was a connection between those. For me, it was not a great leap from being a native rights lawyer, looking at things from the legal standpoint, to going to a museum. And why museums? Well, museums to this day hold the vast abundance, really, of native collections that exist in the world. That's where they are. And, and so if you were going to set up, set up a design for an institution that could speak to those kinds of issues, connections between collections uh, and, and expertise that sat in museums, museums were a good place to be. But I would add as drop note, which we can go to a little bit more specifically later, that it also has something to do with my notion of what a museum is. And it's not, in my view, what lots of people think it is. I have, I have argued against the notion most of my life as a director that museums are nothing more than a house of objects. They are houses of objects. That's what makes them unique. But those are not ends in themselves. Objects are a means to an end. And that end, if you will, is looking at the museum less as a house of objects and more as a gathering space, social and civic space that takes up all kinds of issues that may relate to collections in Native history, but can do so in a very, very contemporary context. This is a good spot to quickly to interject a question. Gerard is in the background feeding us questions from the audience and one has popped up. What would you tell someone who wants to be a museum director? Is it, is it the path to be an attorney in Manhattan and then New Mexico or are there other uh, paths perhaps? Well, I, th I think it's easier than it used to be. If I, I can tell you that if I had a nickel for every time um, somebody asked the question when I first became the director of the National Museum <laughs> of the American Indian, what the devil is an attorney doing being a museum director? Um, but I think that that's changed a lot. And it is this larger conception of, of what a museum is and its place in society as gathering space and civic and social place that I think opens up, if you will, the definition and the, the, uh, the quantums, if you will, of who should be a museum director. It was originally thought that it's somebody who came straight off the curatorial staff and marched up the, marched up the ladder. Um, that is not true now. Uh, regrettably, I think in some people's viewpoint, you will find lots of attorneys these days that are actually directors of museums and some of the biggest in the country. Uh, for me, it was this, it was this um, engagement, if you will, between what I saw as the legal and constitutional prerogatives of tribes and the ability of a museum at its best and as its gathering space for discussion and conversation, debate, even controversy, that made it ideally equipped to address the cultural dimension of native life past and present. Yeah, terrific. Uh, Josh, I'll pass it back to you. Well, I mean, thanks, Len. I, so Rick, I mean, I, I hope I'm, I'm gonna formulate a question as I'm talking, which is what I do. Um, and I hope it doesn't go on for too long. But I, I'm intrigued by that question. It's that kind of, that geographic, 
question that sort of haunted uh, your response to the NMAI and then moving to the Autry. So the museum as this kind of important interlocutor in between space to, to, to tackle broader, urgent legal issues that really are, are driven by fundamentally cultural understandings, experiences, history that are longer in scope. So what's what I'm curious about is that kind of regional difference. At the NMAI, you know, you're at a national museum, you're on the mall in DC, you've got a certain, you know, uh, imperative there. And then you come to the Autry, which you've described in, in interestingly, in interesting ways to me as a kind of national museum, which it is. Yeah. But in some ways, I, your work has also embedded the Autry as a Los Angeles museum, speaking to the people of Los Angeles that, you know, not rather than an ethnic specific museum, it's the city specific museum. So can you talk a little bit about that? Maybe even uh, some examples sure. of that? Sure. I think that there, there are some distinctions in geography, but what I would say is there are not in my own mind distinctions otherwise between these two institutions. There's no question honestly, that I loved having a platform sitting squarely in the middle of the, of the national museum system of this country, the Smithsonian, talking about these issues. And there was, a, there was a certain circling back of history that somehow seemed appropriate, that the, the first citizens of the United States, the original citizens of the United States, what is now the United States, should occupy the last available space on the National Mall, which they did. Because at that time, even where the African American Museum sits was not considered part of Museum Row on the National Mall, although it is and, and deserves to be so. So there, there was a certain there was a certain set of poetics to that, and I think that that was was very important. And and what better place to take this first step that I talked about than sitting squarely on the National Mall? And we purposely aimed our entrance at the hill at Capitol Hill, because we wanted them to be very clear about who was talking and that they should be listening in sort of in carrying on this conversation. But that conversation was the toughest and, and, and the, the most original of conversation because it was going against what had been two centuries worth of constructing the narrative, which had native peoples constantly being described and interpreted. Uh, in the third person voice. You didn't hear a native voice in the dialogue anywhere. And so our first step was to try to be sure that people understood that native people themselves were quite capable of, of talking about themselves with authenticity and with authority. And so it was the injection of that first person voice that I think is the most important step in bringing those who have been outside a conversation into the conversation. But that could have been done in Los Angeles too. And let me then shift, if I may, to, La to Los Angeles, because I think that one thing one has, to write, one has to know is that Indian country and indigenous country exist throughout this hemisphere. And as a matter of fact, probably the most populous area historically in what is now the United States was indeed California. And that was because of these 70 and sunny days that we look at constantly here uh, and the surplus economies popped up quite easily in California. And so the, the, the population actually was very high here in this area, although it was utterly decimated in the middle of the 19th century. But so this is an area which to carry on those conversations that I'm talking about is still extremely apt. In other words, it, this is Indian territory. And we acknowledge the Gabrielino tongue, but every time we open a program at the Autry, quite frankly, and we should because of the, of the connection, traditional and historical, between the Autry and the land where we actually sit that belong to others, actually, um, um, until quite recently. And, and so that's important to me. But what the, what the Autry offers is the opportunity to construct an even more complex conversation than simply this authenticity and authority of first person voice. Because the Autry with its encyclopedic collections and with the mission that it has is quite capable of trying to address locally here in Los Angeles, regionally here in California, 
nationally here as, as a representative of the American West, the immense cultural complexity of this country. And in interconnected ways, we have to get at the complexity, difficult as that is, to try to figure out interrelationships, not always friendly, sometimes harmonious, not always that either, uh, that existed among the cu cultural communities that made up the American West. A, a very timely question has come in. I'm picking you know, off some of these that Gerard is sending in. And it's one of the most challenging intercultural issues that need to be interpreted to a multicultural audience at the Autry. Are there any examples uh, of the phenomenon that you just spoke about, Rick, some of these more challenging issues? Well, I, I think that one thing the Autry does try to do is, all, although everybody expects it to do at least this, is to talk about history. There is very little in the history of the American West, quite frankly, that does not relate rather directly uh, to things that are going on right now and issues that are pertinent. Let me just give you one example, and this is just an example of an exhibit that did that. Uh, we had a couple of years ago through the uh, Getty Project, um, an exhibit called La Raza, which was indeed about a famous and very particular Los Angeles event between 1967 and 1977, from the human rights and civil rights standpoint, what happened during that decade uh, through La Raza, which was, a, which was initially a publication, um, but went far beyond the publication uh, to become a movement, uh, if you will, uh, is, is incredibly important. So it, it is this notion that when you look at history, it is best to do it in full spectrum if you will, from the beginnings of particular issues to where they sit right now. And that indeed was the beauty of that particular exhibit. Uh, and there are other exhibits like that. Another one, which uh, Joss is quite familiar with and was one of my favorites at the Autry, which has also been during my tenure, was Empire and Liberty, which attempted to make the connections between the Civil War which everybody thinks is of having taken place in the Southeast part of the United States and having nothing to do with the American West and what the connections were with respect to numerous communities, white, Native American, Chinese American, et cetera, uh, that come out of telling the stories about the impact and the connection between the Civil War and what was happening in California in the 19th century. And these are all threads of local history, quite honestly. Uh, that the Autry feels very much a responsibility uh, for bringing to the fore now. And, and it is this, this notion of, general, of generally changing the, the, the narrative that we're all used to, used to hearing, which is so important to me. I mean, one of the reasons I became a lawyer rather than staying in graduate school and getting a PhD at Harvard uh, was that when I went to the colloquiums that were held there, honestly, Oscar Hanlon, Frank Friedel, and Bernie Balin, we're not saying very much about uh, other components of American society. I wanted something which gave me the ability, and it was first through a legal career and then through a, a career as a museum director. I wanted to get at those kinds of questions. Mm. And Josh, if you don't mind, one quick one. Uh, one no, of our ahead. board members, Darren Marquez, is watching. And Darren is a member of the San Manuel tribe. We've got a long mm -hmm. 20 or 30 year partnership with the, the tribe and you're well aware of the tribe as well. And his question specific to the successes and failures of the, I had to look this up, the NAGPRA, the National American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Yeah, NAGPRA. Yeah. But any comments on that? Has that something that has hindered or helped uh, in- uh, Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a beauty of the question. Exhibits? It, it's a, it's a, well, it, it has to do with the work of the Autry even beyond the exhibits themselves. It, it's, it has to do with relationships between uh, native communities and the Autry as a museum. The, the NAGPRA legislation, I think, was probably the most important single piece of legislation in the latter half of the 20th century, uh, quite honestly. Wow. In a sentence or a small paragraph, what it did is to require that museums in, with respect to certain categories of, of objects that sat in their collections, uh, they can briefly be described as, as human remains, funerary materials, uh, religious or spiritual objects, and cultural patrimony 
upon request and after following a certain process needed to be returned to Native people. In other words, the judgment made by Congress was that those objects should never have been put in museums to begin with uh, because they were, they were connected directly and essential to the continuation of tribal life and practice. And as, as a matter of, of, of human rights, the notion that battlefields were swept and the remains of native people put first in the Department of the Army and then at the Smithsonian actually was simply inhumane and was immoral and should be undone as promptly as possible. So that's what that was about. Um, we have a kinship at the Autry with San Manuel. Uh, first of all, uh, one of their very distinguished uh, previous chairs, uh, Lynn Valbuena is a member of our board of trustees and still is. And um, it, was, it was during the time when she was chair that we did receive from the um, San Manuel tribe, uh, you know, a very, very substantial support in trying to address questions of repatriation. And I will never forget being with a number of members of the San Manuel community when they came to visit us and go through the collections areas and listening to voices that actually were a conversation between Lummis himself, the founder of the Southwest Museum of the American Indian in 1907 and singers from, from San Manuel. Mm. When members of those visiting us knew immediately precisely who that was. Hmm. And so you get a sense of that, of these important connections and repatriation has been key to reestablishing those connections. Okay, excellent. Well, it sounds like it's been a great partnership for you and for the, the Autry as well. Josh, back to you. Well, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna borrow another question from, from uh, what's coming in from the audience because I think it's connected uh, to what you were just uh, to what we were just talking about with NAGPRA. Uh, it's a question from uh, uh, Natalie Shiras, who who's asked specifically about sort of the problem of all objects in museums is that they often seem inert, lifeless, dead. Um, and she uh, she asks, um, oh, it just oh, I have to scroll up. Sorry. Uh, in your understanding of museums as places for the living, how do you make objects come alive? And so that's navigating kind of difficult terrain with what we were just talking about. Um, what are the ways that you've done? I mean, given that bringing voice uh, to peoples in the museum has been so central to what you do and, and what you've done. Night well, at the museum, I, I think, comes to life at night. I thought. I know <laughs> <laughs> that that's only in the movies, Len. <laughs> um, it's not. That's not quite true in, in real space. Uh, uh, first of all, I concede uh, at the very beginning that, in a certain respects, museums will always be false space, if you will. Um, it, it, it is the entire setting, if you will, uh, the entire history of museums. Um, there was a time, it has never ceased to be the case with Native people, uh, when objects were associated with daily aspects of life, and that's what made them living. They never went up on walls. Honestly, until, until the Renaissance, I think most people would say that was true of Western European and American history too. Um, and, and the difficulty is that that changed when objects went out of daily life, out of homes, out of churches, out of ceremonial practice with native people and were indeed put in, in museums. And so in a way, I'm not gonna sit here and say that we can make them as alive as they really should be and have been historically in any kind of museum. But what I will add to that is that there are steps that museums have taken, I think, both with respect to exhibitions and programming and with respect to programs like repatriation, where you, you do your level best to reconstitute the engagement between those objects that you're seeing in a museum and, and uh, living peoples and, and their history. Some of that is mechanical and technical, uh, which is bringing voice, if you will, into the interpretation of objects, having it not be just a passive experience where, you're being, where you're, you're being preached to off a wall and through text off a wall, but where there is back and forth between those who are observing the objects or seeing the exhibit or program in the museum and, and the, the museum and what it's doing on its own and trying to engage that kind of conversation. 
my my own feeling is that that museums apart and and besides attempting which i think is is also rather false being the forever temple on the hill where where wisdom and knowledge is unitary unilateral and pronounced from the hill rather than anywhere else need to be much more inclusive of the voices that relate to those objects that are on the wall and in doing that I think you bring them alive. Another example that again is taken from La Raza. I remember I, I tend to wander into to exhibits that have just opened kind of in disguise, jeans and not a hat on necessarily or a bag over my head, but otherwise uh, undisclosed because I just want to see what people are saying, honestly, and how they're reacting to things. And of course, what, what impressed me most about that exhibit and which speaks to this question of what lives, what comes alive off a wall, were conversations that occurred when you had a grandparent that was clearly bringing in a grandchild and looking at, uh, at what was on the wall. And clearly the grandparent had been there at the time this happened. But that was a real life experience. And just the conversations that went back and forth in that kind of dialogue and engagement with respect to something that sat on a wall indeed was bringing life to what the museum was actually talking about. And that is, uh, that's important. And from, from my standpoint, it's poetic when something like that happens. Len, can I ask a quick follow-up yeah, to that? Please. Um, because I can hear it, not, I can't really hear it, but I can imagine legions of my students who are engaged in museum studies and presenting historical narratives, fascinated by what you just talked about, about that back and forth part, not the mechanical part of, you know, what mm -hmm. we call in other venues, decolonizing the museum, mm -hmm. but that kind of, the way you destabilize the museum or decolonize it mm -hmm. is by creating that back and forth. So you've given a couple examples, and this is sort of unfair of me, how do you see the, how, how can we do the back and forth off into the future? Because that's, I know that that's a place where a lot of my students and people working in museums now are just so, mm -hmm. this, is, this is the train that they're working in. Well, it has to be intentional. It has to be quite intentional and described very clearly uh, through the mission of the museum and, and how it operates. Um, one thing I didn't say, but it went through my mind, and forgive me if I'm repeating if I already did say it, but remember I did. But I think museums often are in a, in a better position and, and are at their best when they are posing questions rather than assuming they know all the answers. Um, and that is how you engage audiences in this kind of territory that you've just described. And it's why my, my commitment to the museum as social and civic place and space and not simply objects uh, beautifully installed on a wall uh, is so important to me uh, because I see looking at contemporary history and especially that which has happened without expressing any political viewpoint over the past year is that we lack spaces, safe spaces for unsafe ideas. And that is part of the problem with this country right now. And we need to put them in place everywhere we can. And I think that that's what museums should tr be trying to do. Um, they should, they can't do everything. They're only a component of that. But when you think of all of the civic spaces in place, which have collapsed over the last half century, and that includes the United States Congress, uh, organized religion in many respects, etc., cetera, we, we desperately need these kinds of places that are safe places for unsafe conversations. And I think museums can be precisely that, but they are that only if there is this dialogical bilateral engagement between those who come to museums and those who sit inside them in ways that I've described uh, before in this conversation. Uh, Josh, I've got a, a question from an audience member. It's related and you, Rick, you, you touched on this, I think a time or two, but it's about ways that the Autry emphasizes native voices within exhibits, either, either current or, or plans. And you, again, you've hinted at that, um, uh, especially within your answer about bringing objects to life. Uh, mm -hmm. But is there anything there that you might comment on or an example? Surely, I, I can just offer up a, a several examples of, of where we've undertaken that, if you will, um, either programmatically or even through exhibitions that are part of programming. 
let me just give a couple of examples. The, the project California Continued, which is one of the major projects, reinstallations undertaken during my tenure at the museum, I uh, spoke to that quite directly. Interestingly enough, it was supported in large part by state funds that required that two things happen, that that address issues relating to California native peoples, in other words, California, native communities sitting within California, and that it address environmental and ecological issues. I was delighted with that, quite frankly. We're not a science museum, but I was delighted for the opportunity to discuss in the context of California native communities, past and present, uh, our efforts to look at ecological and, and uh, environmental issues. And so we began from this flex point. We began from the standpoint that native peoples themselves had a great deal of knowledge about matters ecological and environmental, which we were going to make part of that presentation. Those were first person voices. They related to everything from the maintenance of, of primary stocks like salmon, uh, to the care of, of uh, uh, wooded areas and, and forests and, and, and natural resources like that. Um, and, but the, the object was to try to take that knowledge um, and then try to make a transition that ended each of these pods in that exhibit with the question, why should all of us care about this issue? And that is, that is the effort to try to go from inside the native community to another place in a museum where it speaks to anybody who walks through that space. Uh, including non-natives. An accompaniment to that, that particular installation, also part of the California Continued Project, was an exhibit that we did uh, about Mabel McKay. Mabel McKay, if there are any folks uh, on this call who collect baskets or know native basketry, will know Mabel McKay. She was the Michelangelo, if you will, of, of basketry and basket weaving. Um, and my, I met her actually uh, when I was younger and first at the National Museum of the American Indian. My father as an artist actually, actually knew her, but she was a remarkable person, both for her technical skills and her artistic skills as a basket weaver, but she was a teacher, she was a student, she was a spiritual advisor to her community, and she took on of those who sought to flood the valleys where their basket weaving materials were contained directly and that took her outside of her own community and face to face with uh, earth movers that were about five times her height. So it is, it is those kinds of experiences that I think promote you know, what, what you were talking about and how we, we've tried to do that. Um, and I'll leave those as examples. I have others, but, but those offer up the point. There, Josh, you're probably seeing a quick shout out from our colleague, David Pagel on the art faculty and well-known in the Southern California art community, mm -hmm. art critic. And he, uh, he loved the, uh, your comment, safe spaces for unsafe conversations. He thought that's mm -hmm. beautifully put and very important to a living and thriving civilization. <laughs> I appreciate that. So interesting question above that, Josh. I don't know if you see the one about online engagement. That's something mm -hmm. we're grappling with in the university environment. And how about at the Autry Museum? Uh, continuing to engage people while not being able to, you know, allow, allowing them to come into the museum space? Well, I, I have to say that that is one of um, our most notable, and I won't be prideful about it, but I am <laughs> proud of our achievement in that area because museums, which are almost totally reliant historically on direct engagement, physical engagement with, with um with visitors and audiences and all of this kind of thing, had to pivot on a dime, if you will, and overnight, almost like yesterday, uh, to try to figure out what they did in terms of, of online engagement. And here's what I, I would say about it. Um, uh, it, has, it has worked for us. I think that what we had to do in switching programming uh, from being physically present to being digitally present um, our lessons that will stay with us even after COVID is all over, because I think we figured out a way, and others should do it too, of how it is that we engage far larger audiences than we have in the past. There are no limits to those whom you can engage digitally. We're doing it right now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's what we did at the Autry. And to an earlier point that was raised, 
given um, social media platforms and that kind of thing. There's just all kinds of things that can be done in that in terms of this bilateral engagement, this back and forth, this question and answer, uh, this division of authority, this division of, of, of authenticity, uh, if you're doing it digitally. Uh, and, and you make it not just a platform that preaches from on high, but a platform that engages community, engages constituencies, et cetera. And those are the lessons I think we have learned that will persist long after audiences are indeed back in the building. We will not change that. There is always a special touch, if you will, to being physically present and looking at beautiful things that are in a museum, but that is not the end of it. And, and I think that we have expanded our footprint in ways that in the future can be quite significant by indeed resorting to things online. We've got a, a few questions about the future and with about 10 or 11 minutes to go, that might be a good direction to go into. And someone just added a question about your advice for your successor. We've got, of course, Stephen Aaron coming in from UCLA and Josh, I know you know him well. Josh is a graduate from UCLA, both master's and PhD. All right. Any advice as you are handing the baton off to your successor this summer? Well, I, I should begin by saying how absolutely delighted I am and I know him well, and I've known him probably almost as long as Josh has, uh, that my successor is Steve Aaron, who will be indeed uh, in the office on July 1st, just after I've cleared out on June 30th. And I just couldn't be more delighted. And I say that for a number of reasons, because I think it's, it's interesting when you look at sequencing in a museum, as we do here at the Autry, uh, I think that there were certain things that needed to be done structurally in, in sort of finishing out the platform by, by how the, op, the Autry operated in terms of mission intention and um, the impact of that on how you assemble programming and exhibits and that kind of thing, intentionality and focus that became institutional and was much more methodical than it had been before. And, and that is something that I suppose is somewhat inborn in me because I sort of specialize, if you will, in startups or transformative situations. Mm -hmm. I'm not so good with the routine, I would say, and not that the entree is ever going to be strictly routine. So that sort of happened. And what excites me about Steve is that he is a brilliant historian. He knows the entree. He's been at the entree before. He was there as the head of the Autry Institute, which was responsible for conducting relationships just as the one we are symbolizing today and connecting the academy with the, with the museum. And I know how he thinks about the history of the American West. And I just have no doubt that, that lots of wonderful things are going to come out of that that relate rather directly uh, to exactly the things that I've spent time talking with you today. It's in very, very safe hands. Excellent. Okay. Well, so let me let me intervene on that conversation. <laughs> you have a chance to tell Steve what your dream exhibition would be. What is the dream exhibition that would do the fulfill the vision that you've laid out, the inside out, the back and forth? Um, what would you? I mean, don't tell Steve what to do, but tell Steve what to do. What, <laughs> <laughs> what's the what's the net what would be the what would be the great exhibition you'd love to see oh i think there are a number of them coming up i think that one of them which uh, with which i wish him with respect to which i wish him great success which is underway right now um and will be finished up by him uh, after he comes in is uh being overseen by one of our our wonderfully talented uh, curators at the museum, a younger fellow, but a brilliant chap, and he's doing great work. And that is redoing the gallery, which is a core gallery of the institution, which we have called Imagination, uh, which really speaks to how one imagines the West, if you will. Um, and originally, you know, that was a, a gallery in which, um, in, in a very apt way, uh, sort of questioning it, uh, being slightly humorous about it. We looked at how people imagine the West. And of course, an imagination of the West can be an unending series of cliches 
uh, that are not very descriptive of what the West was actually like. So this is an effort, if you will, to update that exhibition and to bring it up to the present and then out into the future of how we think about the American West and how we think about the American West. And I have no doubt that Steve will do this, um, is that we need to be inclusive of how we look at the American West and make sure that those who have authority and authenticity to speak are allowed to do so. And what lessons come out of the experience of the American West that may relate to precisely what is going on right now. And that can be everything from BLM to the roots of La Raza and how that is spinning out now. It can be all of that. But it seems to me that if you're looking at an exhibit uh, which can encompass everything that I've attempted to talk about, it would be that one. And since it has all the complexity that I've also referred to, my last, ad, my last statement to Steve is God bless and good luck. <laughs> Uh, Rick, Gerard is reminding me that for upcoming events, our audience members can look at theautry.org, theautry.org. But any, any worth commenting on upcoming events or other exhibits uh, other than the project that you mentioned that you're excited about and you think uh, people- Well, yes, there, there are about. a couple that I will mention. There are a couple that I've mentioned. I've, I've mentioned imagination, which, which definitely falls into that category. It won't up, open until sometime after the Autry, hopefully, uh, yeah. actually opens. Uh, one of the exhibits is uh, that is now there and has not been seen really by anybody uh, who is not a member of the staff of, of the Autry is uh, a wonderful retrospective of modern and contemporary California native artists and art. And it's called, When I Remember, I See Red. And we were fortunate, very fortunate to get an extension of the time that we actually hold that exhibit uh, within the Autry through the end of 2021. So I have confidence that live bodies will actually see it. But if you're looking for, through art, an exhibition that reflects much of what I've talked about in terms of cultural history and public history, that is definitely one to take in. Another one, which will be coming up, is what I call the Dresses Show. And it is that, that, that trick, it's not a trick, but it's a device. Uh, but a very creditable advice of looking at dress, if you will, as a way of talking about the American West and its cultural history and its cultural present. And that one will be nice for me because even though I won't be there, it was supposed to be open before I left, but it won't be. But a prime piece of my own personal regalia will be on exhibit in that exhibit. And it is my shirt, my, I'm Plains Indian, and it, it's the shirt that I will wear uh, for the rest of my life. Uh, so, so those are two upcoming things. There will be ongoing programming. You know, we have the, we have the master show going on right now. I invite people to, to bring that up on, on the website. We are still looking toward having the, um, uh, American Indian Arts Marketplace in the fall, um, and hope that, hope that it won't be entirely virtual. Native Voices has a brilliant season ahead of it. It's our, our theater program. There are just all kinds of things still going on. And fortunately, I think we have been able to keep people from forgetting us completely through the virtual programming that we just talked about earlier. Thank you. And that was the Autry.org. I'm looking at it now. Yet it's rolling through a number of the things that you've got there now. Uh, very exciting. And Josh, this is a good time for your final question. I know that you had talked about earlier. If you don't mind, I'll let you do the honors. Oh, well, thanks. Um, so, so let's be perspective. Let's you know, be both present and, and future at the very end of our conversation. As you enter the next phase of your career and your life, what what advocacy awaits you? What will you be doing? What's the future? Well, some things won't change, I think. Um, and I have thought about that. And I've thought about it in the context of having failed at it once, namely <laughs> retirement. Um, as you know, I retired from the NMAI, which I consider to be my retirement from professional life as a director uh, in 2007 and, and was that for about five years. Uh, so I'm going to take another shot at it, at retirement. Um, I, I think I will be more successful than before. For one thing, I've definitely decided that I do not want to go to any kind of 
nine to five or eight to six or eight to eight kind of appointment uh, because I really want more control over my time. But the, the mix of that uh, will be very similar in some ways. I, I have been blessed uh, in my career, quite honestly, to have had both halves of it. The first half of it as a lawyer, the second half of it as the director of the museum. Uh, and so I plan to center my activities there. I have I had the opportunity uh, to be approached about some particular projects that will occur after uh, I leave the Autry. Uh, some of them are sort of event specific and will be one-offs. Uh, some of them are, um, are engagements as members of boards. Um, and I'm always chatting with my beloved wife about this because she has a very low bar for tolerance of any new board memberships. And so it's a negotiated enterprise I'm in the middle of right now. And I'm trying to tally up those off of which I will be rotating, rotating and so that I can sort of bring some others in behind them. Uh, but they were all things that speak to native rights, including native legal rights, but native legal rights in the context of cultural rights and, and representation. That, that's what stokes me the most, and, and it will. Uh, an example, which I can say because it's, it's, a, uh, it's a, uh, official now, is first of all, I will retain a certain voluntary position at the Autry as president and CEO emeritus, um, ambassador to native communities, and that I will continue to do, and I'm grateful for that. I look forward to, to assisting the Autry and Steve, you know, in ways that I can there. We'll definitely do that. I, I will have been appointed to the uh, Board of Trustees of the Denver Art Museum, which is one of my favorite museums in the American West, has a dazzling, dazzling native art collection in which some of my father's work is. So there are those kinds of things that are popping up, but I, I want to be a strategic and tactical. In, in the way that I do that. I want to do where, I want to do it where those who are asking me to be engaged, they feel and I feel that they will get the most mileage out of that engagement if I do it. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. And I, I've never had a regret, a single regret about coming out of retirement, coming to the Autry. It kept my mind wired and my energy up uh, for another decade beyond which it probably would have before. Uh, but I look, I look to more of that for the future. Perfect. Perfect answer. And, and we are right at the appointed hour. So uh, for our audience, let's thank Rick West. It's the Autry Museum of the American West is the, the current post and on to new adventures, maybe with a few less board assignments, uh, depending on how your negotiations go. Um, <laughs> Uh, but we're happy to hear that you'll still have a role at the museum as well and an emeritus status. Josh, thank you as well. Uh, my partner in crime today, uh, an incredible faculty member here with us at CGU. And then quickly, Sonny and Mary and Gerard, the audience can't see them, but they're in the background helping us to do this today. I want to thank them as well. Uh, terrific job. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Thank All you right. so much. Take care, Rick. You bet. Thank you.